This is Seeking Delphi minicast number three from the Association of Professional Futurists annual meeting recorded live at the Boeing Museum of Flight, Seattle, Washington, July 29th, 2017. I'm Mark Sackler. The future lives here. After hearing presentations about the health of the Earth and its people on day one, day two turned its attention to the air and space beyond the Earth, focusing particularly on space exploration and exploitation by commercial ventures. The morning sessions featured two Boeing scientists, as well as speakers from two newer commercial space ventures. Here's a quick rundown. I'm with Brian Tillotson, who is a systems technology chief engineer for Boeing Research and Technology. He was one of our speakers in the space uh, space here at the Boeing Museum of Flight this morning. Uh, Brian, just tell us a little bit about what you do, what your job entails. Okay, so at Boeing, I'm uh, chief engineer for a part of Boeing Research and Technology. Uh, BRT does most of the R&D work at Boeing, and my part, called systems technology, is responsible for electrical, electronic, and optical R&D. So uh, I get to look at projects ranging from gate-level semiconductor uh, work up to like the overall electric power architecture for a 787. So Brian, you spoke about something uh, kind of near and dear to me this morning because I recently did a podcast with science fiction author Will Mitchell on his book about self-replicating machines and followed that up with an interview with Alex Ellery at Carleton University who is uh, developing a 3D printer that he hopes will self-replicate. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your vision for 3D or for replicating machines uh, in space, and space mining. Okay, well I was aware of uh, some of the work going on with self-replicating 3D printers on Earth. In fact, one of my young colleagues at Boeing had one when she was in college. She could get about 99% of it uh, copied now, they use, uh, I gather, a special kind of goop um, is the technical term for uh, what those machines run on. But I think, given time, we'll be able to um, do the same thing with the kind of raw material we find on asteroids. Uh, in fact, we heard some of that today from uh, Chris Lewicki of Planetary Resources. They're already working on a 3D printer that uses asteroid metal. So my vision is that we'll be able to send machines out into the solar system to land on these primitive bodies and using material they find there, they can build copies of themselves. Now these will not have to be the elegant uh, artisanal uh, spacecraft that we build now. These are things that'll be built in a low gravity environment. They'll spend their entire lives in a low gravity environment. So they can be pretty flimsy. Um, making a copy of a machine like that shouldn't be too tough. So I think our, our technologists will be up to it in the next few decades. Thanks. My pleasure. Very good. Really fun. I'm with Marna Kegel. She's an Associate Technical Fellow uh, at, at Boeing and uh, specifically in Strategic Foresight. Marna, tell us what that job entails. I do monitoring of the technology landscape and looking at emerging trends, how those will impact the business that we're in and how businesses work in society and how all of those changes might be something we should consider in our decision making. You said something uh, this morning that very much interests me because I have done um, some research projects on CRISPR-Cas9 editing. I come out of the healthcare space originally in my career. Uh, you envision the potential for using that to maybe enable humans uh, to better tolerate a space environment. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, well, whether it's that technology or something else, I just envision that there could be a time where we look at how we edit ourselves as human beings so that we can better adapt to a life in space or long space journeys rather than trying to just create systems that will enable our current Earth uh, evolution bodies to exist in those different environments. What are some of the things that could change that way? Well, we know that there are struggles with uh, being in a gravity environment and then being in a non-gravity environment, so how that impacts our, our muscles, our eyes, all of our systems. Uh, maybe we could reverse aging processes so long journeys are easier for us to manage as humans, and that would just change the whole course of how we explore space. So right now I'm with Jeff Roberts. He's the Director of Launch Programs for Space Flight Industries. Uh, 
Tell us what that entails, Jeff. Certainly. So a big part of our business at Spaceflight is where we take a lot of small satellites, put them together for missions, and get them onto orbit. So mostly small satellites cannot afford the full price of a rocket. So we get a bunch of them together and make it affordable for them. So as a director of launch programs, I oversee a lot of our launch portfolio. So what are uh, any, any particularly interesting um, projects you see in the next few years that you're working on? What's the, what's the most challenging? Well, definitely the most challenging is a mission that we're calling SSOA, which is short for Sun Synchronous Orbit. Uh, that's a mission that's going to have about 60 to 70 satellites on it, all different sizes, different shapes, different purposes, from about 30 customers. And we're putting that on a Falcon 9 rocket uh, for launch in uh, early to mid-2018. Okay, what about, uh, I think you mentioned something about working with somebody uh, for an XPRIZE launch as well. Yes, so we were fortunate enough to sign up one of the Google Lunar XPRIZE competitors uh, who is attempting to put a rover on the moon and actually uh, beam back images from the moon. And so we've got them onto a rideshare mission. Uh, so they will go to a super synchronous geotransfer orbit, and from there they'll get the rest of the way to the lunar surface. And we're hoping to launch them in, within the next year. So I got one last question for you because you're talking about 60 satellites into orbit. I'm hearing about massive swarms of low Earth orbit satellites. Uh, Elon Musk wants to provide internet uh, that way. What are we going to do with all that space debris? Have you guys looked at that problem? Oh, definitely. We're required to do uh, to look at that problem uh, is a contingent upon getting licensing for the launch. So all of our spacecraft are required to prove that they will deorbit within 25 years uh, based off of uh, their, their design. So they are going to be put into self-cleaning orbits. So I'm with Chris Lewicki. He's president and CEO of Planetary Resources. He was one of our presenters this morning. Chris, tell us uh, what Planetary Resources is, what you're doing. Planetary Resources is the asteroid mining company, and our mission is to be the leading provider of resources in space for the people and products that are going to space. Uh, by mining the asteroids and getting things like rocket fuel from hydrogen and oxygen and all the materials we'll need to build things in space uh, using iron and nickel and technologies like 3D printing. Where are you at this point? How far away is this from becoming a reality? What, go through some of the stages quickly of, yeah. to getting there. Absolutely. Well, it's a reality right now. We've got a team of more than 70 engineers and scientists and businessmen uh, working out of uh, Seattle, Washington. We've just established a subsidiary in Luxembourg. Uh, we're about to launch our third and fourth satellites, which are researching a lot of the technologies that we'll need to do mineral exploration on near-Earth <laughs> asteroids. And by the end of 2020, we intend to launch our first first mission to a number of asteroids uh, to find the first site of the asteroid mine in our solar system. When do you think you're going to bring stuff back? <laughs> <laughs> so we're working by, by finding the first site of the asteroid mine. We want to find out where we want to invest in. And just like any resource project, whether it's an oil well or a mine uh, or you know even timber, we want to make sure that that first destination is e economic. We'll establish that in about five years, 21, 2021 and 2022, because uh, of orbital mechanics and development time, things and like that. Within the next five years after that, we'll actually start first small-scale experimental production on an asteroid. So this is something that's probably uh, more than 10 years away, but less than, less than 15. So uh, very, very soon. And uh, we're starting small. We're starting simply. Uh, but as with all things, uh, you uh, break a crack in the dam and then you, uh, and you open it up. Quick question that I didn't get to ask out there, but it's got me interested. I hear about the difficulty of getting into Earth orbit, how you're going to mine on the asteroids and go between the asteroids. So it seems to me there's a technical problem bringing volumes, significant volumes of stuff back, uh, you know, and re-entering the Earth's uh, atmosphere. How are you addressing that? Well, yeah, that's a, a very common question. And actually, the distinction is we're not intending, at least initially, to bring anything back to the surface of the Earth. The market that we're serving is a market that's in space. And just as you said, since it's so hard to get into space in the first place, our point is to make sure that you don't have to bring a lot with you. Uh, and when you arrive in orbit uh, at a space station or at a manufacturing facility or where you live and work, uh, we can give you the resources that you need to breathe. We can give you your uh, rocket fuel that you need to get back and forth, your energy and your whole environment. And those are things that you won't have to carry with you on the rocket ride up to space. The meeting wrapped up in the afternoon with talks on the value of science fiction in envisioning the future from sci-fi author Brenda Cooper and Scout.ai founders Barrett Anderson and Brett Horvath. 
In the coming weeks, Seeking Delphi will feature in-depth interviews with several of the individuals we heard from in Seattle. Until next time, I'm Mark Sackler.